right, church? Man, it is fun to be together in one room, isn't it? This is the best. I love it. All right. Well, we, um, we are continuing in the Gospel of John. Uh, we started in the Gospel of John in January 2023. Do you guys remember that? It was a while ago. And uh, from chapter one, we've been building and building and building slowly but surely to get to John chapter 19. And in John chapter 19 is really where we get the death account of Christ, the crucifixion narrative. We've been building all throughout the Gospel of John, and we've started off with this beautiful poetic introduction where John talks about how Jesus came into the world, was denied by his own, but who all who did receive him, uh, he gave the right to become children of God. And then it goes into the story of what Jesus did, proving himself uh, and his signs, changing water to wine, walking on water, healing the lame, all of it being a signpost and evidence to Jesus being the Messiah. And then in John chapter 19, we get the account of his death. And all of it's been building up to this. But something happens right before John chapter 19 that helps us understand John chapter 19. Because if you're at all like me, I'm a church kid, born and raised in church. I've heard the crucifixion narrative. I've read it. And oftentimes when I read it, sometimes it feels like I'm reading the newspaper, unfortunately. Does anybody resonate with that? You've read it, you've heard it, and you're like, okay, I understand the events that took place, I understand the sequence of them, I know many of the details, but John gives us something right before John chapter 19 that helps us frame John chapter 19 in a different way. He gives us an introduction of a brand new character that we haven't yet seen in the gospel account. It's a character that he mentions really briefly. All the other gospel writers mention him a little bit more in detail. But he mentions this one character for us to understand John chapter 19 differently and to understand the crucifixion differently. Do you guys know who that character is? Barabbas. The name Barabbas might not mean much to you, but I want you to take a peek at this picture. If you think Barabbas, this might be what comes to mind. Does anybody have this image in their head when they think about Barabbas? <laughs> this is from The Passion of the Christ, uh, directed by Mel Gibson. Do you know when this movie was made? 2004. 20 years ago. Makes me feel so old. Makes me feel so old. 20 years ago. That was a long time. Uh, and this is the picture that I have in my mind when I hear the name Barabbas. Uh, when the actor Pietro Cerubi asked Mel Gibson how he should play Barabbas, Mel Gibson said... Barabbas is a wordless beast and a ferocious dog. And that actor did an awesome job playing that, didn't he? But there's a little bit of a problem with that caricature of Barabbas. Whenever I look at that picture, Austin, would you mind bringing that up one more time? When I look at that ferocious beast, rabid dog, sticking his tongue out at a Roman centurion, I look at that, I'm offended by it, a little bit amused by it, and then I walk away and I don't think about it again. When I hear Barabbas, and I look at Barabbas in that sense, he's almost so vile, he's so ferocious, he's almost a feral animal, and I don't really wrap my mind around him a whole lot because he's almost cartoonish in his wickedness. He's silly. You look at him, and he comes out, and he's like, nah! He's like, what is, is this WWE? Like, what is happening? (laughs) And it's a little bit hard to interact with and to engage with. And because of that, we are a degree removed from Barabbas. We don't really wrap our minds around him. We don't think about the implications of Barabbas or why the gospel writers would put him where they do at this point in the story. Jesus is about to be falsely accused, flogged, and beaten. They're going to take a crown of thorns and shove it on his head, and then they're going to drive spikes through his hands and through his feet, and they're going to hang him on a cross to die, where he'll either die by asphyxiation, where fluid fills his lungs, or by a heart that bursts because of the pressure that his body is under. And before we get to this point, before we get to the crucifixion narrative, John introduces us to Barabbas. He seems disconnected from the rest of the story. He seems random. It's a quick reference. But this is a character that is introduced to us that is in prison for his sin, that deserves death for his sin, and then is set free from the punishment of death that he deserves because the punishment is placed on a substitute, Jesus Do you think Barabbas has anything to do with us? Does that sound familiar at all? John introduces us to Barabbas to help us understand we're not supposed to read about the death of Christ as distant observers, church. 
We're supposed to read about the death of Christ as active participants. Because when we hear Barabbas' story, we're meant to think, that's my story too. In reading this this week, I was confronted with that. Because I've heard of him, and I've watched the movie, and yet I haven't ever considered what Barabbas has to say about me. And we'll read John 19 like we're reading the newspaper until we see that John 18, 38 to 40 is meant to be a, a guilty verdict that accuses us and then pardons us when we see that Jesus didn't just take Barabbas' place. The gospel tells us this morning the good news that he took your place too. Is that the best news we could ever hear? It's the best news. A great exchange has taken place in the good news of the gospel. We are free from the prison of sin and death because it was placed on a substitute, Jesus. That's what the gospel proclaims, and that's what we're going to unpack in this account. I want you to check out our big idea for the day, and then we're going to unpack this as we go to John 18, and then we're also going to go to Luke to be able to fill this out just a little bit. The story of Barabbas accuses us, pardons us, and sets us free. Why? I'm Barabbas. Let's unpack that and see how this unpacks in this story. Before we do that, though, we're going to do something that we don't oftentimes do. Um, Oftentimes we pray before we dive into the sermon. haven't prayed yet. I want to take a second for us to pray. Because I'm willing to bet when I say you're Barabbas and I'm Barabbas, and you have that image in your mind of the feral animal with his tongue out, you're like, don't tell me I'm Barabbas. We need the Holy Spirit of the living God to illuminate his word to use it like a sword to cut to our hearts and the posturing and the callousness and the self-righteousness that we walk around with on our best days and cut through it and then ultimately show us Jesus in a new way. I want to pray for us and just ask God to do this. And I'd invite you in this time to to pray with me. Uh, If you are uh, comfortable with it and if this is something that you feel like helps to embody your heart posture, you can open up your hands and open up your palms and say, Okay, Lord, this is my posture of reception. If not, I invite you to pray this with me just in a heart that's in that same posture as we ask God to work in us. So let's pray before we get into this passage specifically. Let's pray. Ah, Lord, we're going to read a story that many of us may be familiar with and probably feel a degree removed from. And I'm praying in Jesus' name that you would help us see ourselves in Barabbas. We spend, and I spend, a lot of my time focusing on other people's sin. And that blinds me and calluses me and makes me hard to seeing my own. Help us, Lord Jesus, see the prison of sin that you rescued us from. Help us put our faith in Jesus, not just in a way that reminds us of what we've been saved from, but also invites us into what we've been saved for. And Lord, I pray that we would be amazed at the work that you have done in your son to break the shackles that bound us, to deliver us from death row, and to give us something that we don't deserve. And that's life in Jesus' name. So Lord, we're just asking that you do a work in our hearts. Tear apart our self-righteousness. And God, would we see Jesus in a new way for your glory and for our joy. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to do just a little bit of context work before we get to John, and then, like I said, we're going to read John, but then we're going to jump to the the Gospel of Luke to see it a little bit differently. First thing that I want you to know as we do some context work is Barabbas is mentioned by all four Gospel writers. Did you guys know that? All four Gospel writers acknowledge Barabbas. Now, that's really interesting because John doesn't even mention all 12 disciples. Did you know that? He doesn't even mention all of them by name. And yet, he is writing this gospel account much later than all the other gospel writers, and he's choosing to mention Barabbas. That's a big deal, because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all acknowledge Barabbas. Now, if there's a crime that takes place, let's say there's a robbery that takes place, and they go and they find four guys that witnessed that robbery, and they ask those four guys that witnessed the robbery, hey, what did you see? And they all saw the same shady character lurking around the robbery and stepping towards the scene of the crime. Do you think that shady character had a role to play? Yes, because four different writers and four different observers saw the same thing and is recognizing the same thing. 
The fact that all four of them are acknowledging Barabbas had a role to play should wake us up to say Barabbas isn't a side character. He's not just a supporting character. There's something that we need to see about Barabbas and slow down to recognize it. That's the first thing. All four gospel writers mention him. The second thing, do you know what Barabbas' name means? Take a peek at this slide. Barabbas is the Aramaic Baraba, which means son of the father. Now, we're talking about a great exchange that's taken place today. We're talking about the son of the father that goes to the cross. And do you think it's interesting that Barabbas' name is literally son of the father? I think that's interesting. That's going to come into account here in a little bit. We're going to come back to that. But we've got to know that there's more going on here than just a side story and just a quick little blip on the gospel narrative. There's things that we need to see as we read this gospel account that wake us up to the fact that there's a lot going on here. So with that, let's get into John 18. Jay and Sue read it, but let's read it again. We'll read it, recognize some things through it, go to Luke, and then we're going to unpack this. John 18, this is what we get. After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, and this is Pilate, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. This is the shortest gospel account uh, recognizing Barabbas, so it goes pretty quick, but there's a few things we got to see. Look at verse 39. Take a peek. What time is it at this point in the story of the gospel? What time is it? Don't say game time because it's not right. (laughs) What time is it? Passover. Passover time. That's interesting. Okay, we're, we're reading a story in this account of a guilty man that is pardoned because a substitute is provided for him and a substitute takes his place. That's interesting. At Passover, the Jews remembered that God passed over their sins because he provided a substitute. Do you think that matters? It matters big time. John, all the way back in John one twenty nine. do you know how he introduced Jesus? He said this, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And now in John 18, we see that at Passover time, the Lamb of God will take away the sins of the world. But something is happening at a time where the Jewish people celebrated a substitute that was put in place to take away sin. There's a lot going on to this story. We also see that Pilate said that Jesus wasn't guilty of what he's being accused of. Do you see that in the story? Pilate said, I find no guilt in him. Pilate saying that this substitute, that Jesus is innocent. And then someone says, a man will be released. And as we read the story, we might think, oh man, well, this is the time for Jesus to be released. Jesus, Pilate found no guilt in him. This is the time for him to be set free. It would make sense for the person being set free to be Jesus, But that's not how the story goes. Barabbas goes free. And he's not innocent at all. He's guilty of sin. What is he guilty of? John tells us. John says that the crime that Barabbas is guilty of is robbery. But there's a lot more going on to what Barabbas did than just robbery. And we see that as we kind of do some word search, but then also as we do a zoom out and see other gospel accounts. The word that John uses to describe robbery is lestes, which means not petty crime, cat criminal, or cat burglar. It means plunderer. This is different than the word kleptase, which is where we get kleptomaniac from, or thief. John is saying that Barabbas wasn't just a thief, but Barabbas is a plunderer. He's not the cat burglar that sneaks into your house late at night and grabs some things and then leaves. He's the plunderer that comes into your home in the middle of the day while you're having dinner with your wife and kids, takes all of your things, breaks it to the ground, and then he says, this is my home now, as he murders you and your family. Like, that's a horrible image to have on our mind, but that's the image that we need to get here. This isn't a polite guy. This is where Mel Gibson said a rabid animal or a ferocious dog. This is a murderer, not just a robber. This is a violent plunderer. This is the guy that deserves the death penalty. This is the guy that should no longer be on the face of this earth. And yet, he walks free. He goes free while the innocent king of the Jews takes his place. 
What? We should be startled by this and offended by it. Take a look at John, or Luke's gospel account. It fills out some more of these details where I hope the offense in us starts to rise even more. Luke 23. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. Talking about Jesus. And after examining him before you, behold, I do not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I find in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. And he released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked. But he delivered Jesus over to their will. John said that Pilate found no guilt in Jesus, but Luke says that Pilate found no guilt in Jesus three times. I find no guilt in him. I find no guilt in him. I find no guilt in him. And not just that, where John says that Barabbas is just a robber, Luke wants us to know that it's way worse than that. He's an insurrectionist. He's a rebel. He's a murderer. He deserves the punishment of death. Not just deserving it morally, but take a look at Numbers 35.30. This is the law of God when it comes to sins like this. Numbers 35.30 says this, If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the evidence of two witnesses. Church, This isn't a kleptomaniac that's doing three to five years with the possibility of parole. This is a man sitting on death row because he's killed people in his quest to be in charge. Murdered in his desire to have authority. And then something crazy happens. Because the crowd is relentless in their accusations about Jesus, Pilate releases the rebel murderer, sets him free to walk, and allows the punishment of death that Barabbas deserved to be placed on Jesus in the most offensive and horrific exchange the world has ever known. Barabbas is accused of murder, but Jesus is the one that stands accused in his place. Barabbas deserves punishment for his sin, but Jesus is exchanged to be punished in his place. Barabbas receives the free life that Jesus deserved, And it's Jesus that gets the sinner's death that Barabbas deserved. And Jesus takes Barabbas' place on the cross. Do you think the story has anything to do with our story? Oh my goodness. If you're not seeing it by now, John and Luke and Mark and Matthew all want us to see that Barabbas isn't a side story in the story of the gospel. Barabbas is the story of the gospel because Barabbas' story is my story and it's your story. And if you put your faith in Jesus, you look at Barabbas and you say, that's my story. Are you willing to admit that this morning? (laughs) Like rabid dog, ferocious animal, sticking tongue out at authority. (laughs) Ha! You can't reign me. You can't control me. You can't say that I need to be second. I'm in charge, and I'm going to pursue violent means to do it. This story of this violent insurrectionist rebel, we read and we have to wonder, this is the introduction to the cross of Christ because we have more in common with this Barabbas than we do with Jesus. We're Barabbas. The story of the gospel tells us that we are accused but that we're also pardoned and then we're set free because of Jesus, church. In the gospel, we stand accused. We are sinners that deserve death. The gospel gives us the bad news of our sin before it gives us the good news of what Jesus has done for sin. We are worse sinners than we could ever know, and our sin not only brings death all around us, it deserves death, and we're on death row whether we know it or not. That's the bad news that the gospel starts with. Romans 6.23 declares it to us loudly. The wages of sin is what, church? It's death. It's death. 
That's horrible news. Horrible news. But that's the reality of sin. Sin invaded a garden of relational perfection. Our dear friend, Pastor Steve Hart over in Spokane, he tells it to us like that all the time. That sin invaded a garden of relational perfection. It invaded it and it distorted it and it brought death to our relationship with God and death to our relationship with others. Where all of us, apart from God's intervening work, we are walking crime scenes. We've seen murder. We've committed murder with our hearts. What's the first sin that happens right after Adam and Eve rebel against God in disobedience? What do their sons do? Murder. And yet here we see a murderer on trial. We see a murderer who deserves death. We are accused. We deserve death. But the gospel never stops with this bad news. The gospel then tells us the good news, that we are accused, but we are pardoned. The gospel says that we are sinners deserving death, but we are pardoned. I am forgiven. Why? Because Jesus was punished in my place. I'm a sinner that deserves death and I stand before a holy God who stands in the judgment seat and at the moment where the gavel is ready to fall, giving us the sentence of the bad news of the death that we deserve. Do you know what the judge does? The judge takes off his robe, he steps down from the stand and he stands in the gap between you and the judgment seat and says, I'll take his place instead. That's the gospel, church. You're forgiven. Your debt is wiped clean. The record of wrong that stood against you has been canceled. Why? Because it's been nailed to the cross. <sighs> what amazing grace. I'm forgiven. Why? Because a substitute was provided for me. A substitute was put in place to be punished in my place. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul says it like this. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The gospel is all about a message of substitution, a great exchange that's taken place. He who knew no sin becomes sin, and because of that, we get his rightness, his righteousness. We're made right because the punishment that laid on us was placed on Christ. What? 1 Peter 3.18, Peter says it like this. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Is this exchange incredible, church? When we say gospel, when we say the word gospel, this is what we're talking about. And we're acknowledging the fact that when we look at Barabbas, we go, oh boy, that's me. Our forgiveness isn't free. We're forgiven because a great exchange has taken place that exchanges our guilt for Jesus' freedom because he gets our guilt and we get his freedom. Christ suffered for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And because of that, not only are you pardoned, but the last piece of this declares we are also set free. Set free forever to live free today. He gets our punishment, we get his freedom. He gets our shame, we get the Father's acceptance. He gets our death, we get his life. And we receive this when we admit that we have sin and when we place our trust in God's Son to cover our sin. The reason why I'm harping on this and the reason why I'm banging this drum is because we're not just little sinners, church. We're not just little inconvenient moral sinners, victimized sinners, Sinners that are maybe a degree off. We are rebellious spiritual insurrectionists that steal with our desires. We disrupt with our words. We murder with our hearts. But just like Barabbas, we are forgiven. We are set free. Can you imagine being Barabbas? Can you imagine that for just a second? On death row, ready to be hung up on a cross to die. And yet somebody says... You're free. They unlock your chains. They loosen the shackles that bind you. And you say, what? Why? Why am I free? Well, a great exchange has taken place. You were swapped out with an innocent man that didn't deserve to be here. And he chose to do it. Jesus isn't a victim in this story. We've been hitting on this over the last few weeks. He chose this path in perfect obedience to the Father because the Father loves you. 
you're set free to walk. And now you're set free to live free because of what Jesus has done. Set free because the punishment we deserve has been paid in full by Christ. John Bloom, who's the founder of, or co-founder of Desiring God, says it like this. Barabbas is a gospel parable. And the lesson is this. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's a gospel parable. Do you see it that way? We got to admit that we're Barabbas to see it that way. How do we receive this amazing gospel parable? How does this good news become good news for us? Romans 4 tells it like this. And to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. You ever tried to work to clean yourself? You ever tried to work to clean up your act? I remember being a kid, seeing Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 up on the wall of our church, but feeling like it was my responsibility to free myself from addiction, from temptation, from self-righteousness, that we got to try to clean up our act when you come to church. Maybe you feel like you can't take communion quite yet because you're not in a place of being clean enough or ready enough. And this passage says, to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, that faith is counted as righteousness. You don't work for this. You don't earn it. You've done the opposite to deserve it. And yet it's given to us as a gift. Not working, not striving or making efforts, but it's gifted to us. And it's given to us and we are made right. It's faith. John's been saying that all throughout the gospel account, that it's belief, it's belief, it's belief. All of this is that we would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing have life in his name. It is trust. Yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I deserve hell. But Jesus took my place. It's almost too good to be true. But I trust it. I believe it. This is why he came. This is why he lived. This is why he died. He did this for me. And I've been swapped out at great cost. There's a pastor and theologian from the 1950s named Donald Gray Barnhouse who says it like this. Barabbas was the only man in the world who could say that Jesus Christ took his physical place. But the Christian can say that Jesus Christ has taken my spiritual place. With that, Christianity can be expressed in three phrases. I deserved hell. Jesus took my hell. There is nothing left for me but his heaven. Have you put your trust in Jesus yet? We don't know everyone's story that's coming here. We know that there's people here in this room that haven't yet put their trust in this Jesus. I deserve hell. Jesus took my hell. And I get nothing but his heaven because of that. Faith, trust, acknowledgement of my sin, and celebration that Jesus is a Savior. This is the heart of the gospel. This is what changes us. This is what sets us free. Now, we don't know Barabbas' story, and we don't know where it goes from here. We look through church history and there's not a whole lot of mention of them. We read and rather watch the Passion of the Christ and do you know what happens after Barabbas is set free? (laughs) After he sticks his tongue out? You know what he does? He goes down in the crowd and he's like, ah, I'm like a rabid animal, watch out. And even so, I'm like, oh boy, I can't connect with this at all. We have no idea what happens to Barabbas' story, but you know what the story of the gospel is for those that trust in Jesus? We're set free and now we live free. We live free. Our big idea, the story of Barabbas accuses us, pardons us, and sets us free is a big deal because we've been set free to live free. And this freedom starts now. It's now when we put our faith in Christ. John Bloom said it like this. The more we comprehend the weight and extent of our sinfulness, the better we can grasp the magnitude and scope of God's forgiveness and grace at work in our lives. I pray that that hits home, but I want to tell you something. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around this sometimes. Do you feel free in everyday life, just everyday living? That's a genuine question. Oftentimes when we put our faith in Jesus, we have this moment of like, freedom! Yes! Amazing grace! How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And then in time, we forget that freedom. That's what happens. 
We get choked out by the cares of this world or stuff going on in our own hearts and our flesh and the sinfulness that's still in us because we haven't yet been given these glorified bodies. Man, it's so easy to fall back into stuff, isn't it? We do that all the time. As I was studying this passage this week, the Lord just nailed me. And I just want to tell you where it's hitting home for me. Because I read Barabbas, and at first, I'm interested. I like the contextual stuff. I read the different gospel accounts, and I'm interested and entertained, and my mind is tickled. But then as we slow down and we consider the implications of Barabbas and how we need to acknowledge that we're Barabbas, it just started to hit home for me. Um, In my life... uh, I think the Lord's wanting to show me something, and oftentimes I try to ignore it, and I push away from it. I'm a pretty clean-cut guy, just generally. Like, I, I shave my head multiple times a week. I kind of like to get a good sparkle going. I like, I like to be able to, like, present like I'm pretty put together, pretty cleaned up, pretty tidy. Um, when I have dirt on my shoes, my wife knows I bring out the Clorox wipes, and I, <laughs> I try to get it off. I hate having white shoes because it's like constantly burning through Clorox, just constantly trying to get it off. I present as a pretty cleaned up, nice, tidy guy. Um, My home, uh, we had friends over the last few nights, and multiple times someone said, those are some nice lawnmower lines. And I'm like, you're right, they are. Those are very nice lawnmower lines. (laughs) I'm so glad you've listened to the sermons of how I'm sharing that that's an area of conviction, and now you're affirming my sin. Thank you. (laughs) It It was great. We had a good laugh about it. It feels good to be put together. It feels good to have lawnmower lines in my grass, but there's a problem with it. Sometimes we project being put together on the outside to hide not being put together on the inside. Like, I know you know what that means. And as I'm reading this, I'm learning that, that that's a thing that I struggle with, that I think the Lord's opening my eyes to see in ways that I haven't seen before. Twice in the last two weeks, so interesting, when God wants you to see something, he just nails you. Twice in the last few weeks, I had somebody say almost the same phrase to me. They said, Kyle, you're a pretty put-together guy, and my life isn't that put-together, so sometimes I have a hard time knowing how to be around you. I hate when the Lord wants to show you something, but I'm also so thankful hearing that from people that really care about me and that really love me. It messed me up a little bit because my wife knows that I'm a broken person. She sees it every day. (laughs) The elders of our church know that I'm a broken person and I don't have it all together. They see it and I share it with them. But I just recognize that I don't lead with that. I don't like to lead with that. I don't like to have weakness and unbelief and fear and doubt be front and center. I hate that. Our culture says don't do it, but I don't blame culture. I blame me. I blame my flesh. My flesh every day says don't do it. Don't do it. Don't let it out. Keep it together. And yet, that's where the gospel hits home, church. When we read about Barabbas and we say that was me, we don't just say that used to be me, but that could be me in a second. Apart from the grace of God, there go I. And just like Paul, who longed to be free from things that were harassing him, weaknesses, he was able to say, I will boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ rests on me because of what Jesus said. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. The Lord's nailing me with this. When I present put together, like I have it together, like things are tidy and my head is shiny and I have lawnmower lines, you don't see the grip that an addiction to pornography had on my life in my 20s. You don't see that. But it consumed my life. Almost ended the start of our relationship. You don't see escapism in my flesh that calls to me every day when things are hard and says, dream about that vacation. Plan that hike Be thinking about that adventure because that's way easier than dealing with stuff in front of me. You don't see this daily fight deep within for control that's exhausting. Every day, people-pleasing and anxiety that prowls around the corner when things don't go as planned. It comes out with my kids, with my wife. It comes out everywhere. You don't see that put together. I'm not even close to that. And I have to recognize that I don't lead with that. I lead with put-togetherness. And I'm sorry for that, church, because that is showing in the pattern of my life the opposite of what the gospel declares. The opposite of that. 
The thing I'm learning from this passage is that I'm not just a moral sinner that Jesus saved. I'm a wicked, well, a, a wicked rebel, excuse me, a wicked rebel deserving death that Jesus sees, step towards, and then trades places with. And the story of my life and yours should not be, look how far I've come, but should be, look what Jesus saved me from. That's the gospel. I'm learning more and more in this season that I need to speak my weakness, share my failure, acknowledge sin publicly, not just for my freedom, but for our freedom. I'm not put together, and you're not put together. Jesus is the one that holds us together. And if there's any semblance of stability and hope and joy, it's not because we're awesome people, but because of Christ alive in us. Yet not I, but Christ in me. Our freedom is in the gospel, not in being put together. I want you to look at something that nailed me as well as we're working through this in this passage. Paul talks about his weakness and his sin in a really interesting way that should wake us up. Paul says three different times in progressive ways that he's not a great guy. Now, Paul is like the superhero apostle. He's the one that did some pretty amazing things. He wrote the majority of the letters in the New Testament. We read Paul and we're like, I want to be like Paul. But this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, pretty early on in his ministry. He says this, describing himself. 1 Corinthians 15. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So not many of us in this room, and we're not going to do a show of hands, but not many of us are murderers. Paul was a murderer. Paul was. And part of his ongoing gospel testimony was what Jesus saved him from. He didn't get saved from it and then move beyond it and then refuse to talk about it. He actually says, I'm the least of the apostles, and I don't even deserve to be called an apostle, this ambassador, missionary ambassador that's been commissioned by Christ. He's like, I'm the least of them because of where I was rescued from. But you know what he says a little bit later on in his ministry? He doesn't just say he's the least of the apostles. He says this in Ephesians 3.8. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Do you see what he did there? He went from least of the apostles to less than the least of all God's people. You'd think that maturing in the Christian life gets him to a place where he's not really talking about his sin as much anymore. And like he's kind of put together and now he's like a champion and he's rocking it and he's doing some pretty amazing things. But it's interesting, as he progresses, he actually is putting his sin on display even more so. His weakness on display even more so. From I'm the least of the apostles to I'm the less than least of all God's people. And not just that. Look what he says in 1 Timothy. Later on in his ministry, even further on, he says this. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. He's not saying I was the foremost. I used to be the foremost. He's saying I am, present tense, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. If you are leading with put together, you are being a hindrance to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That's convicting for me. If I'm leading with everything's good, everything's fine, no, no. It's not, but Jesus is the one that holds me together. Everything is fine because of Christ, not I, but Christ in me. He's saying, I am the foremost sinner, but he received mercy because the story doesn't end with us being foremost sinners. The story ends with us being this projecting display of the perfect patience of Jesus for anyone who would put their faith in him. That's something that we're called to, church. Boasting in weakness, being content in weakness so that the power of Christ rests on us. Are you talking about your sin in order to celebrate your Savior? It's a real question. When was the last time you acknowledged the fact that you're a sinner? Not just past tense, but present tense. I was chatting with someone and they said, man, I I don't know. Um, I didn't realize that every time I took communion that I actually had to confess my sin. That seems like a lot. (laughs) Like, yeah. And yet it's paid in full. (laughs) Paid in full, set free, forgiven, 
We get to talk about our sin to celebrate our Savior. Paul did, and he did it to point to the perfect patience of Christ and to set an example for us as believers. The gospel sets us free to boast, not in ourselves, but in Jesus. The gospel sets us free because it is the only message that will kill our self-righteousness. When you come to church, is someone a bigger sinner than you? Got it all wrong, and you don't understand Barabbas. If someone is a bigger sinner in our eyes than you, we're thinking of ourselves far too highly. We are Barabbas. We're worse than we think, but he's better than we could hope for. We're set free to live free because Jesus traded places with us when we didn't deserve it. We can admit our sin. We can celebrate Jesus. We can say, yes, I'm Barabbas. That's my story. I don't know what Barabbas did with his freedom because of the great exchange, but I know what I'm going to do with my freedom. I'm going to boast in Jesus. I'm going to boast in the cross. I'm going to celebrate God's saving grace and daily grace to me because I didn't do anything to deserve it. I don't know what Barabbas did, but I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to celebrate Jesus. Would you hold us to that as a leadership team as we call you to that as a church? Walk in this freedom. Walk in this. Would we celebrate it? Would we acknowledge the fact that we are hot messes apart from Jesus? Isn't our Savior amazing? Isn't he the best? Andrew Wilson says this, Barabbas was a revolutionary and a murderer. He has no right to be remembered at all, let alone held up as an example of divine grace. But that's the whole point. Neither do I. And Christ died for me anyway. And through his substitution, I become a Barabbas myself, a son of the Father. The gospel changes our lives, church. Let's walk in this. Let's celebrate this. Let's live from this. Let's boast in Jesus. Let's not cling to our self-righteousness or our morality. Forget that stuff. Cling to Jesus. And we want to invite you in just a second to come to the cross and celebrate this Jesus who traded places with us at great cost for himself. Let me pray for us, and then we'll invite the worship team to come up and invite you to communion. Let's pray. Hmm. Father, I am saddened, and I know we're saddened, by how quickly we point the finger at others. We read the story of Genesis, and we see what happens in the garden, and right after sin came into the world, right away, Adam said, it was her, she did it. And Eve said, it was him, it was the serpent. And yet the reality is, is that we're all guilty. Apart from your rescue, and apart from your grace, we stand guilty as hell. And yet, you have intervened. You have stepped towards us. You, Father, have provided a substitute to take our place. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we thank you for this amazing work. And we thank you that we now can boast in the cross of Christ. We cannot, we don't cling to our own abilities. We don't cling to our own posturing or being okay. We celebrate the Jesus who made us okay and who holds us together every day of our lives. Would we be a church that lives transparently for the glory of Christ? Would our witness of our weakness and the sufficiency of Jesus be so winsome in this community that others come to know you, Jesus, not because of our strength, but because of Christ alive in us? Would we confess sin? Would we walk in the freedom that you've purchased us for? Would we bring it into the light quickly as great opportunity to make much of Jesus? And Would our joy in Christ be full in that place? for your glory in our lives and beyond us. Thank you for your gospel that accuses us, then pardons us because of Jesus and sets us free to live free. We praise you, God, for that, and thank you for this reminder from your word today. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen. Amen.